The Home Tech Podcast is supported by you. To find out more, go to hometech.fm slash support. This is the Home Tech Podcast for Friday, October 25th from Denver, Colorado. I'm Jason Griffin. And from Sarasota, Florida, I'm Seth Johnson. Jason, we're back in the saddle. We are. We are. This is our last show before Halloween. I'm double checking myself there. I think we're going to record one more before Halloween, but it won't air uh, before Halloween. So what are uh, what are your plans this year, Seth? Uh, let's see. We've got this plans are kind of this year. I'm kind of doing the same thing I did last year for the decorations outside. I don't think we're doing anything additional except maybe maybe a smoke machine outside. Maybe we'll get that put out because we got nice. got a pretty All cool right. smoke machine. Well, you're making me feel kind of like a bum. We've got we got some of those spider webs that you put on the bushes this year. Yep. Yeah, and uh, we got a couple jack o' lanterns outside. Oh, that's all I got. No, well that that wouldn't pass muster around these parts. No, no, <laughs> no. We we've got we've got the um, last year I did the projector thing with the singing heads from the Disney haunted mansion thing. I don't know if you've seen that, but like that's right. I think you told me about that. Yep, I got that ready to go this year. I kind of built a, a a box for the projector to live in a little bit better than the cardboard box, <laughs> the black spray painted cardboard box I had last year. So I I spent today and kind of put together a little wooden box which. Honestly, my carpentry skills doesn't look any better than the the cardboard box that I had last year, but <laughs> at least it's sized more appropriately. Well, it's not a beauty contest. No, and it's going to be spray painted black and, uh, you know, not really, um, you know, you can't see it at night. It's just going to have a projector that lives inside of it. So um, hopefully that'll be... Well, I used to work, uh, I used to work with an installer who whenever we would do, you know, something that didn't turn out great, he would say, well... It looks good from my house. So, Seth, <laughs> your projector box looks great from my house. There we go. Well, that's all I got. That's all I got to worry about. So, yeah. <laughs> it sounds, that's a pretty good uh that's a pretty good yeah, uh, striving for excellence. Yep, exactly, exactly. <laughs> all right. Well, what do you say we jump into some home tech headlines? Let's do it. Uh, according to a press release published on Tuesday, October 22nd, uh, researchers at Brigham Young University have recently developed a new protocol that can boost Wi-Fi signal range for IoT devices to more than 60 meters. It's nearly 200 feet uh, away from the access point without, this is kind of cool, without the addition of new hardware. Uh, normally, Wi-Fi uh, requires at least one megabit per second uh, to maintain signal, but this newly developed protocol, known as On-Off Noise Power Communication, or ONPC, is apparently able to maintain signal with just one bit per second. <laughs> Not very useful, but uh, and it, it turns <laughs> out to be that one bit per second is just enough to allow many Wi-Fi-enabled devices that simply need to send an on-off message to function. Uh, the press release mentioned a few examples such as uh, garage door sensors, sprinkler systems, or air quality monitors. Uh, yeah, that's that, that's very true. Like you know, things that need to send like um, some, some like like a water water detection thing, like something uh, is detecting water or it's not detecting water. There's there's no analog difference in between. Like yeah, fifty percent chance I am detecting water. No, no, it, it is detecting water. It's not. The house is flooding or it's not. That's right. Uh, yeah, that that would be a perfect little device to, to, to get this new protocol put in place and, and maybe be used with existing equipment. Kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. The, the title's a little misleading. Researchers found a way to extend Wi-Fi range. Well, yes and no. Uh, you're not, you're not going to be watching YouTube, uh, over this signal. Uh, but you know, like it says, it does work for certain things. It, it works. It's kind of interesting. It works by letting Wi-Fi enabled devices transmit wireless noise, along with data. Quote, they programmed into the Wi-Fi sensor a series of ones and zeros, essentially turning the signal on and off in a specific pattern. Uh, the router is then able to distinguish this pattern from surrounding wireless noise, therefore knowing uh, you know, that the sensor is still transmitting something, even if data wasn't being received. Um, it's kind of an in interesting approach. And again, like we alluded to there, it could be handy for uh, sensors or things like that that don't require a whole lot of bandwidth, uh, but where that extra range might uh, might be really helpful. So kind of an interesting technology. Yeah, it reminds me of uh, how analog, no, analog um, balanced audio works, right? On the XLR cable where it, one has one phase reversed, one phase the other way, and if it picks up noise along the way, it kind of gets canceled out by the little right. analog circuitry at the end. Interesting little technology, and maybe... I, maybe we'll see it coming out. I think they missed the mark here calling it ONPC. I mean, Wi-Fi these days, 
it's going to have to have a number. It's going to have to be called something like Wi Fi right. negative three, <laughs> I think is probably where that would be. <laughs> negative. <laughs> negative. That's right. <laughs> All right. Well, moving on here, SpaceX is confident it can start offering broadband service in the United States via its Starlink constellation in mid-2020, coming right up. This according to the company's president and chief operating officer, Gwen Shotwell. Getting there will require the company to launch six to eight batches of satellites and also finish the design and engineering of the user terminals, which is not a minor challenge. SpaceX CEO Elon Musk has a Starlink terminal at his house, and he used it to send a tweet early on October 22nd, quote, sending this tweet through space via Starlink satellite. He tweeted to his 29 million followers, whoa, it worked. So uh, SpaceX making some progress here. A few other bullet points I think we wanted to hit on this one, but interesting interesting story and um, definitely, uh, you know, always always fun to watch what Elon, Elon Musk is up to. Yeah, that... that, that. Crazy Elon Musk. I I don't know what to to think about him, but like uh, this this is a cool this is a cool product. I mean, uh, this will bring real low latency broadband out to people in rural areas in in, in ways that we just have not seen um, in, in in the past. Like this is this is I don't, I don't know, Jason. You've probably had you you you've worked mostly, I think, in the LA markets and then and then up in Denver. Maybe in Denver, you probably ran across these satellite uh, and internet yep. device. Oh, yeah. yeah, so like mm-hmm. they are just horrible. And when we say low latency, that's not what we're talking about. Like you would you would send a request out, like you would type in a web address like Google, and you just kind of have to wait for that to like go up, go through Google, come back. And like this would be just as fast as what you have, if not faster, than what you have. In, uh, in as a local like cable service or, or, or fiber to the home service um, going up to these low, low orbit satellites. So this could be game changing for rural areas uh, who and, and quite frankly, it would be another competitor that, you know, I, I, I'm locked to Comcast here. I can't have, you know, fiber, uh, fiber to the house, like the fiber to the house service here. I'm, there's only one person that offers high speed Internet at my house um, and I can't go through anybody else. So this would be an, an option for me, too. But I think it's going to be a real game changer for those people in areas that have no service uh, other than maybe like DSL or something, <laughs> something ancient, ancient technology. Yeah. Yeah. It said the price point is being studied. Shotwell said millions of people in the U.S. pay $80 per month to get, quote, crappy service, end quote. <laughs> uh, can't argue with that. She didn't say whether Starlink will cost more or less than 80 per month, but suggested that it would be a segment of the public the company would target, as well as rural areas. Seth, like you mentioned, uh, that currently have no connectivity. Yeah, yeah. I, I, my, I got an update on my crappy service. Um, <laughs> for some reason, and I don't, I don't want to like brag about this too much, but like, they've been giving me credits, credits like in in the in the orders of hundreds of dollars every month, and I'm too scared to call them and ask them what it's about. <laughs> so I haven't paid like a cable bill in like a couple months now, and I'm really, I'm really. Oh getting worried. man, the secret's I th- out. I think what's going to happen is they're going to realize their error and be like, hey, hey, you owe five months worth of cable service and or, or internet service and and all these late fees on top of it because you never paid your bill right do you so, take your yeah. chances that's the I don't question know. 50 50 50 50 just like that <laughs> sensor it's 50 50 i don't know that's right man crappy service but i can't complain yeah it, it, it's not really working great either i was gonna crappy call service but they're I, paying you so yeah yeah <laughs> exactly I, I can't complain can't be paid to complain so that's funny All right, well, moving on, Google has confirmed that it's fixing a problem in the firmware updates that have bricked home and home mini speakers. Numerous owners have reported that their devices are completely unusable, and if you're affected, you'll see the speaker's four lights stay lit up. Uh, Not mine. Mine's working. Uh, It's not clear when there might be a fix. However, it's a serious problem for those unfortunate owners affected by the glitch. The good news is Google is replacing effective devices regardless of whether they're in and in or out of warranty until the fix is issued. Not a good deal. Yeah, if you release a firmware update that literally is breaking devices, so at least Google is, uh, you know, is replacing these. I noticed in the uh, original story they had issued an update. In the original story, there wasn't uh, clarity about whether they would be replacing devices that were out of warranty. It turns out, thankfully, they are. The story also goes on to note that some people have had success by temporarily unplugging the power cable or performing a factory reset, but others have not been so lucky. 
Uh, also mentions that this does not appear to affect the Home Max displays like the Home Hub or Nest branded speakers. So if you got any of those, uh, I think you're in the clear for now at least. Yeah, yeah. We um, a couple of months ago we introduced an, an uh, a driver update feature. Uh, it, it's taken me about. I don't know. It's taken me about a year to put together <laughs> correctly and, and trust myself and my code enough to actually release. And it, this is my, my greatest nightmare that I, I push something oh, out I can that, imagine. that bricks a bunch of controllers or bricks a bunch of like drivers or something like that. Like I just, uh, I've, I've done everything I can and, uh, in a, a, that I know of, but uh, man, everybody, people are human. They're going to make mistakes. And, uh, this is totally understandable. I, this is, this is the fear I have. So the fear every every yeah. time I press the update button, this is the you fear. You can imagine I have. pretty much every developer who's ever pushed a remote update <laughs> uh, to any piece of hardware probably shares that concern with you. Yep. Yep. All right. Well, speaking of Google, Google's Nest smart home division has seen major upheaval this year, and according to a report from Bloomberg, the changes aren't sitting well with residential builders who formerly integrated Nest products into their construction projects. Bloomberg's report says that the residential builders who, quote, collectively purchase tens of thousands of Nest devices each year, end quote, have started avoiding Nest products due to Google's changes. Another house electronics installer, David Berman, told Bloomberg, we were more or less forced into the switch. When people buy a connected device, they expect it to connect. That's not something that happens with Nest anymore. So Google's <laughs> changes a little bit not, much, David. I mean, yeah, I was gonna say <laughs> Google's change is not uh, not being greeted warmly here, but I, I don't know that uh, that this is really giving a fair shake uh, to Google. I'm not sure. Seems a bit hyperbolic that last statement there, like because it still does connect. You just have to have one of the Nest partners. They've gone out of their way to kind of like. Uh, say that, hey, we have these new APIs. Um, it, it's harder for smaller companies and smaller projects uh, to get involved with it from what I understand, but it's not like this stuff doesn't work anymore. And it's not like it's like you bought a connected thermostat with the Nest branding on it and uh, it doesn't work tomorrow, right? Like it still works. You just have to use a different app. Right, right. <laughs> I, I, so a yeah, yeah. little hyperbolic is a good, a good word for it, but... Um, you know, I think all the same. There's a, there's a takeaway here. Certainly, I, I I can especially empathize with uh, with builders who aren't necessarily following this stuff as closely, and they wanted to partner and have a line of products that were just going to work a certain way. And I guess buyer beware, because we all who work and live in this industry uh, are a little bit more expecting uh, of this sort of thing. And I guess builders perhaps maybe got a little bit spooked by it, which I I can certainly understand. So. Um, an interesting angle to the story and interesting to see Bloomberg uh, reporting on it. <laughs> Empathizing with builders. That's a new one. I, uh, I'm, not, I'm not going that direction. <laughs> you going to stay out of that one? Yep, yep, yep. Fair enough. White Hat hackers at Germany's security research labs have developed eight apps uh, for Lexixils and for Google Home Actions uh, that all passed Amazon or Google security vetting process. These skills or actions posed as simple apps for checking horoscopes, uh, etc. Behind the scenes, these smart spies, as the research call them, eavesdropped on users and fished for their passwords. Interesting. Very interesting. So th these these guys made, uh, guys and gals, who knows, uh, made four Alexa skills and four Google Home actions to basically steal, and, and, and they passed all the Amazon and Google security vetting things. Yep. And now they're in the store, and people can download these and lose their passwords. That's that's wild. Yeah, it, it it wasn't totally clear to me if these are still in the store or or what. But these are white hat hackers, so presumably, you know, uh, Amazon and Google were made aware uh, of this after the fact, and I, I would assume that the apps were pulled uh, and were never really doing any you know real harm. But I, it's an interesting story because it does point out you know yet one more area where we simply need to be conscious network security. Data privacy; these are big topics that are front of mind for a lot of people, and I think you know we've we've discussed a lot about just um, voice assistance in general and the privacy concerns that are are inherent with that technology. But this story takes it kind of to another level, and I, I don't know. I've never had a a, a skill on my Echo ask me for a password, um, so I don't know how normal that is. That to me would seem really strange if that ever happened, and I, my flags would immediately go up. Um, 
but assuming that is uh, somewhat normal behavior, again, I, I've never seen that before myself, uh, then this would be something to be really aware of. But it does mention that the apps w- would also do things like uh, respond with a, a fake error message or complete a command, but instead of you know stopping the recording, they would just stay open and be able to record audio without you knowing it, uh, things of that nature. So, so again, so buyer tricky. beware. Tricky, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, so they were just kind of doing some some sneaky things there with the apps to prove uh, what's possible. And again, thankfully, these were white hat hackers. So hopefully this will help raise awareness and improve security standards at the companies. I think when you had the mics on on both Google and both uh, both Amazon, the little lights should be on top, like lighting up. Like I know the Amazon one would like point at you or try and find you wherever you are in the room. Uh, the little LED on top would try and find you. Um, but yeah, it's it's, yeah. it's not a good thing, something like, because I mean, what about a false positive where you accidentally set that command off and then it's uh, it thinks that you tried to do something and you're like, oh, that's a silly thing. And it's still over there recording you and you're, you're not paying attention to it. Um, very interesting, though. That's right. Yeah. So I think th- this is we're still pretty early in this technology uh, in the grand scheme of things, but something definitely to be aware of. <clears throat> Moving on here, Best Buy is offering free next day deliveries over the holidays. The expedited shipping will be available to almost everyone. Story says 99% of customers uh, and will include almost everything except for heavier items like big screen TVs and refrigerators. If customers are outside of the next day zone, they'll still get free standard shipping. Uh, This offer could make Best Buy more of a threat to Amazon, especially because Best Buy shipping is free and Amazon customers still have to sign up for Prime to get the free delivery perk. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. You have to have the Prime. It's free delivery. But not free, what, next day delivery? Well, mo- there's some things that are free day, next day. A lot of them are like two or three day uh, that you get from Amazon. But uh, this, 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 is, uh, this is interesting. I don't think this is, this is a very sustainable type of, uh, of, of thing that we have going on here with all of these random delivery vans and vehicles showing up at the house all day long. Like, I'll have Amazon <laughs> stop by the house like three or four times. And, and it, somebody, is crazy. it could be somebody's random car. It could be a random uh, Amazon truck. Like, uh, it, it could be a white van that has a bunch of, like, I don't know if you've looked inside them, but they have a bunch of, like, bags full of boxes inside of these, and I guess they just get their bags and have to go out and deliver them. But it doesn't seem like it's a very sustainable thing. Now Best Buy is going to try and do it. Man, this is this is It's wild. crazy. This Walmart, is, this, yeah, Walmart yeah. It has experimented with it as well. Um, the other day, I, I got up from my desk and just went took a walk around the block to get some fresh air. Uh, you know, this nice weather is, uh, is we're running out of time here as winter approaches. And I was just kind of enjoying a, a walk around the block. And it just so happened that uh, an, one of those Amazon vans that you were talking about was <clears throat> in front of me, stopped at a house. And as I sort of walked around the block, he was almost right in front of me like the whole time because he was stopping at so many houses uh, <laughs> that it was literally like it was almost like I was walking next to this van. And I remember just thinking like, Man, this is going on in like every neighborhood across the country. Yeah, yeah. And this guy's stopping at like almost every fourth or fifth house. He had like a package. I mean, the the volume uh, at which this is going on is it's hard to wrap your brain around. Yeah, yeah. It, it just doesn't look sustainable to me at all. Like, I, I just, I don't, I don't know if it's gonna like it's got something's got to break here, right? Like we're just gonna run out of room on the streets, basically. Everybody's just gonna have a, a delivery van parked in front of their house. Yeah, it's just gonna all be like autonomous drones soon. <laughs> right, right. They'll 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 zoom over your house and just drop <laughs> a package with a parachute, and it'll land in your backyard somewhere. That'd be nice. That'd be Only nice. half joking. Well, uh, speaking of speaking of retail here, smart home enthusiasts in the U.S. have been waiting impatiently, impatiently. Uh, for IKEA to release its affordable smart blinds. Uh, guess what? They, we need to wait no longer. Despite a series of delays, the blinds are now available to purchase in the U.S., but only in selected stores. Womp womp. Uh, the blinds were set to arrive in the U.S. in April, but their launch has been delayed for uh, a bunch of unspecified reasons. We've, we've heard it was going to be in April, then it got pushed back to October. Like, or we, sorry, we, we heard it was in April, it got pushed back until, quote, later in the year, and then we heard October... I think the U- U.S. is kind of like last on, on the list here to get them. They've been available overseas for a while. We've been kind of just like 
watching YouTube unboxing videos in uh, in, in in Swedish, right? To to hopefully <laughs> that's right. Like just I want I want I want these blinds. Why why can't I have them? And they're just not here. But now they are. So go to IKEA and get a get a hundred and fifty dollar blind and 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 see how cool blackout roller shades are. Yeah. It says the blinds have appeared on IKEA's U.S. website, but they cannot be ordered online. Uh, according to this story, you'll have to head to one of the selected physical stores. At the time of this writing, those stores include California, Colorado, here in Colorado, uh, Utah, Indiana, and Oregon. So we'll see. I'm looking at the sizes here, and I don't know if I have any windows that match those sizes. But I uh, definitely don't. Yeah, there's, there's no chance of me I'm, getting these. Yeah, they've got, it looks like currently they're listed um, $154 for a 32-inch by 76 and three-quarter or $149 for a uh, 30-inch by 76 and three-quarter. So it's only a couple of sizes listed there. I'll, I'll have to take a look at this. I am in the market for some blinds, um, and it would be cool to get get some uh, get some motorized ones. So we'll see if these uh, if these are a viable option. Yeah, it's all going to come down to the sizes. And I, man, it's just got to be... So tricky to like determine what sizes they're gonna offer. Uh, oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> just I'm like not sure how, they, how they would do that. <laughs> no, no, me either. Me either. Uh, it says both sizes are blackout roller style blinds, which are controlled wirelessly by the remote control. Uh, they're powered by a lithium ion battery, so you don't have to get power to them, which is nice. Uh, and it's removable and rechargeable. Uh, so that's 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 really nice to have. Uh, and um, I'm hoping to maybe maybe Florida will get added to that list one of these days, and I'll. Uh, make it over there to the uh, the IKEA store and get one, uh, pick one up for I don't know guest room or something like that. We may have a window that's that size. I don't know. Got some weird windows here. Go grab a shade and some meatballs. Hot dog and 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 what are those cinnamon bun <laughs> things you can get? A six pack of cinnamon that's buns. That's right. Yeah. That's right. All right. Here. Well, last story for this week that we want to spend a couple of minutes talking about. Um, a story from Digital Trends here. Google Nest Wi-Fi won't support Wi-Fi six. Here's why that's short-sighted. So I think this is an interesting read, irrespective of what you might think about Google's decision to leave that technology out, which I think you can probably make uh, reasonable minds could disagree on that. Uh, but I thought it was a good story just to get a sense for what manufacturers are now already having to start think of, thinking about with regards to Wi-Fi 6 and as consumers and especially for the professionals uh, in the audience, I, I think there's some insights here about um, about this technology that that are useful uh, to uncover. So first, talking about Google, uh, the story talks about the quote glaring absence of Wi-Fi six and how it makes the router less future-proof than it should be. Google has, of course, defended this decision, citing the cost and lack of available compatible devices in the home. The story asks the question: Is this a cop out? Uh, most people. The story goes on to say upgrade their phones every few years, upgrade their PCs uh, even more infrequently, but routers and modems are even further down the list. Most people don't pay attention to these vice devices unless there's a big malfunction. Um, and I wanted to stop on that point. I, I think that's generally true, been true in the past at least, but I do wonder with um, all the advances in Wi-Fi and the inexpensive mesh systems that have now come out, uh, will that remain true or will, you know, will mesh Wi-Fi or Wi-Fi in the home in general becomes something that people start to upgrade uh, more often. And, and there's, of course, a whole separate conversation about the environmental sustainability and everything of, of that if we're all going out and replacing our routers every year or two. Uh, but, you know, I, I did think that was an interesting point. I was thinking about my experience, and it's true. I mean, I, I've only upgraded my Wi-Fi uh, a handful of times, maybe over the last 10 years at most. Um, so I think they make a good point there. Yeah, I was wondering, like you have, you have the Eero, right? I do. So like, but before that, I had Airport, and I had that for I don't even know how long. I mean, it was many, many years. Right, right, and and you haven't. I mean, <laughs> you you. I don't know if you have a new phone or not, but like, if you did have a new phone, would you like? Because it does say here in the article that Wi-Fi six. Ecosystem is starting to grow. Uh, the iPhone 11 series and Samsung Galaxy 10 S10 and the Note 10, whatever that all this Android stuff means. Um, there, there are some phones coming out now that have Wi-Fi 6 built into them. Do you, would you find it compelling enough that your phone didn't get like faster speeds? <laughs> I don't know. Like why? Why would you? Like compelling enough to go upgrade my router? No. Yeah, I wouldn't. 
spend like three hundred yeah. more dollars just upgrade to a new wireless system. I I I, I got to say that that Eero is probably going to be in your house for a long time, right? That's that's right. what I would think. And I would think that for most people. That's right. Yeah, and that and that's what the story says. And that you know that that's basically the point they're making, which is you know Google looking at releasing this new product without Wi-Fi six certainly had to consider that. How often yeah. do consumers upgrade their Wi-Fi? Um, so people are going to be buying these devices, and most likely these devices are going to stay in their home for for many years. And as more and more Wi-Fi six devices come to market, owners of these routers won't won't be able to leverage that right so that of course segues into the big question of like well how big of a deal is that uh, the story talks about wi-fi 6 is being described by proponents as quote the biggest thing to happen to wi-fi in a decade and quote wi-fi 6 promises to ease congestion reduce interference and provide a more stable connection uh, it relies on a new orthogonal frequency division multiple access or o FDMA, OFDMA architecture, uh, which allows more devices to simultaneously connect to the same access point. So there are some compelling things about Wi-Fi 6. I don't profess to fully have those internalized, meaning, okay, I've seen them on paper, but I haven't really given the thought to like what that would mean to my user experience. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I think you asked the million dollar question. How big of a deal is this? Like, if, if you end up with an iPhone 11 that can do Wi-Fi 6 and a, and a Google Nest Wi-Fi that can't, how big of a deal is that? Yeah, it, I, it, I I don't have... I'm trying to pull up the specs in front of me. Is the Google Nest doing Wi-Fi 5? Because Wi-Fi 5 seems like a pretty good pretty good deal. To, to do Wi-Fi 6, like, they're talking 9.6 gigabits per second for Wi-Fi, which... I don't know about you, but my internet speed is nowhere near that. Like, so if this is what, like, what is, what is the point of having Wi-Fi six maybe in a consumer product like this, the a hundred dollar, a hundred dollar consumer product like this? Like, I guess this, I'm trying to like draw on the whiteboard behind me, right? Like, what? Why do I need to have this Wi-Fi six feature if Wi-Fi five? which has the theoretical speed of 3.5 gigabits per second, which is still like massively, massively, massively more than most people have. Like, I think you can get one gigabit per second or yeah, one gigabit per second uh, speeds now uh, in, in a lot of areas and maybe more, but like still you're talking about your phone, right? Like you're not, maybe maybe a laptop or something that, that's going to be like what are you streaming outside of the house in that you're going to need to have on a portable device that's going to have to need five gigabits per second like i can't think of anything i, yeah. really, I literally can't think of anything and if you're transferring stuff around the house and you need it to be at you know five gigabits per second well, just hardwire the thing man because that's gonna yeah. give you a better <laughs> better deal it's true yeah so i i don't know like this seems like a super specialized thing and just to have the coolest latest highest number like who cares like seriously this is the, these specs are so beyond what anybody has um i just i'm not seeing it i'm not seeing it at all yeah yeah Greg makes a comment in the uh, in the live chat here the point of having wi-fi 6 is the same as having an 8k TV, which is pretty funny, uh, but also also true. I mean, I think he, he actually makes a great point there in the sense that like a 4K TV for the foreseeable future is going to be a, a pretty awesome TV, right? And um, that's going to be that way for a while. And so Wi-Fi 6 is probably a similar thing. Nice to have. Uh, well, none of this is technically a need to have really, although I guess Wi-Fi nowadays kind of is. But point being, uh, yeah, Wi-Fi 5 is probably you know what the google nest wi-fi is going to ship with is likely going to be perfectly fine uh for 99.9 percent .9 of users for the life of that device right i think is i think is is my take on it so you know it's an interesting article um like i said it is worth reading at least to have awareness um of of what's going on out there and what are, what are some of the things to start thinking about as you upgrade your own Wi-Fi, or certainly as you're doing it uh, as part of a business, you know, if you're a professional out there, definitely good to be aware 
of Wi-Fi 6 and start getting educated uh, about what it is. So you can at least make, uh, you know, make an informed decision. Yeah, I'll also include a, an article in it from The Verge over in the show notes that also has a couple of other small points, and I would say very minor small points. Um, it has, I guess, better Moo, Moo Mimo. We've talked about that, the Moo Mimo. You yep. can have... Uh, you, so they've upgraded it that, and I guess um, it allows devices to kind of plan out their communications with the router, which reduces the amount of time that they need to have their antennas up and powered, which means better battery life for your phone. So there's some kind of like negotiation that can happen back there. And also, I think the biggest uh, the biggest spec bump is for better security. Uh, it has WPA3 as like a mandatory requirement for Wi-Fi 6 certified devices, um, but note devices that may support Wi-Fi 6 do not have to do the WPA3. But better security always, for, especially for Wi-Fi, is always a better thing. So, um, again, this is not not that I don't think... I bet you could do WPA3 over Wi-Fi 5, and Google could turn that on as the soft software update, right? So, like, I'm not really seeing... I'm not really seeing too much of a compelling offer other than, like, okay, Wi-Fi 6 is bleeding edge, but I think Google could probably wait a year maybe two, and uh, then introduce a device at $99 that also has Wi-Fi 6 in this whole, you know, Wi-Fi 7 or 8 maybe out by that point, but who cares? Like, Wi-Fi 6, there'll be plenty of Wi-Fi 6 cell phones around at that point that'll be able to take advantage of getting streaming 9.6 gigabit per second stuff off the internet. I have no idea where you'd get that from. So, like, how, that's insane. Like, absolutely insane speeds, uh, t- just to think about. We were just talking about Wi-Fi negative 3, earlier in the show doing bit by bit operations. <laughs> this is kind of like <laughs> the complete opposite of that. Yeah, that's right. All right, cool. We'll include uh, links to that story as well as all of the other ones that we've talked about on this week's episode uh, at our show notes at hometech.fm slash 278. Once again, that's hometech.fm slash 278. While you're there, don't forget to sign up for our weekly newsletter. We'll send you weekly show reminders as well as other occasional updates about all of the great things going on here in the world of home tech yeah and don't forget you can also join us in the chat room live wednesdays starting sometime between 7 and 7 30 p.m eastern you can find out more how to keep an eye out for that over at hometech.fm slash live absolutely and we are back live this week we had a couple of weeks where we weren't live one week we were off and last week as listeners know i was nursing a a back injury so we got through the show but we didn't do a live one uh, but we are back live this week. We've got Greg uh, hanging out tonight, uh, several other folks joining us on a pretty regular basis. So we'd love to have you uh, again, hometech.fm slash live if you're interested in that. Uh, moving on, Seth, pick of the week. <laughs> and this one's a little throwback uh, that I loved, a clever door sensor that plays the bass riff from Seinfeld. Uh, you'll have to cut that in in post uh, when somebody enters the room. Uh, so you got a little video of this from laughingsquid.com. First, I, I'd heard of that site, but, you know, maybe I'm behind on that. No, I don't think you are. It's uh, the first time I've heard. <laughs> uh, This looks like very much like a little DIY uh, product. Got a little sensor wired in, and you can see the, uh, the audio cables coming out the back of this box. Out to his stereo system, and, you know, exactly as advertised. It, it's sensing by motion, I guess, when the door opens, and... And cueing that famous riff that we all, all of us uh, Seinfeld fans uh, know and love. This is made for you, Jason. This is the only reason I, I put this on there. Uh, it's because I, I knew I knew you would pick this right off the board and right off the top of the stack there. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. This is a pretty cool device. Right. Built, uh, it is completely DIY, but it's all enclosed, all built in together. Uh, there's a little video of it. It's made with an Arduino, which is a little like you have to like get down on the metal level. And, well, not really on the metal, but like... You have to do some hardcore programming to make it work. An infra- infrared sensor and an Adafruit Music Maker Shield, which is little, basically a board that clips on top of the Arduino and um, and uh, gives it music ability. So, God, re- must have been a really fun project for them to put together, and I thought it was cute. And also, it played Seinfeld. So, hey, that's pretty cool. Just got to get one of these for my house and just put a little smile on my face every time I walk uh, up and down from my basement office. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure my wife would love that. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, if you have any uh, feedback, questions, comments, picks of the week, ideas for a show topic or guest, please do give us a shout. We would love to hear from you. Our email address is feedback at hometech.fm. Once again, that's feedback 
at hometech.fm or visit hometech.fm slash feedback and fill out the online form. We want to give a big thank you to everyone who supports the show, but especially those who are able to financially support the show through our Patreon page. If you don't know about our Patreon page, head on over to hometech.fm slash support to learn how you can support Home Tech for as little as $1 a month. Any pledge over $5 a month gets you a big shout out on the show, but every pledge gets you an invite to our private Slack chat, The Hub, where you and other supporters can, of the show can gather every day for the inside baseball conversations about all aspects of home technology. That's right. And if you're looking for other ways to support the show, we would love if you would take a few minutes to leave us a review on iTunes or on your podcast app of choice. Those reviews definitely help more people find the show. So if you enjoy what we do here on the Home Tech Podcast, please take a minute to leave us a review. We would really appreciate it. Aiming for those stars, man. We're aiming for those stars. That's right. <laughs> Five stars. Uh, Home Tech is also a proud member of the Technology.fm collective of podcasts. You can find us and other great shows over there like Home On, The Smart Home Show, and DTNS. It's over at Technology.fm. Go check it out. All right, Seth. Well, that'll do it for this week. I hope you have a great uh, and safe Halloween. Oh, yeah. yeah. And uh, I will look forward to reconnecting with you again next week. Send us some pictures of the the home setup if you can. I guess those are kind of hard to get at night, but... uh, you can find a way. I'd love to see. You can you can shame me in my uh, lowly setting here. I've been meaning to get it together. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I do have a PSA for everybody, anybody that's still listening. Uh, don't set off the smoke smoke uh, smoke machine in the house without first disabling the smoke alarms. It will, in fact, set them off. Um, <laughs> <laughs> good good advice. As they're designed to do. Um, and the fire department may or may not come to your house as well. So just throwing that out there. <laughs> going to leave that there all right seth well uh i will uh, look forward to speaking with you again soon have a great weekend all right you too have a good one all right take care